Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Miles. I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago Law School, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's workshop on race and the law of business and finance. Thank you to all our attendees and thank you to our panelists for joining us. I wish to extend a special thanks to our colleagues at the University of Virginia School of Law, and especially Dean Risa Golyaboff and Professor Kathy Huang, and the entire John W. Glenn Jr. Law and Business Program at the University of Virginia for their great partnership in this two-part academic workshop. I also want to thank Professor Anthony Casey at the University of Chicago Law School. Tony Casey is our Deputy Dean, the Donald M. Ephraim Professor of Law and Economics, and Faculty Director of the Center on Law and Finance at the University of Chicago Law School. Today's workshop in Race and Business Law builds on an important discussion facilitated two weeks ago by Professor Huang. Last, though two weeks ago, panelists Afra Afsharipur, Carlos Chapman, and Elizabeth Reese shared their insights on teaching issues of race and the business law curriculum. And as the panel discussed, plus faculty play a critical role in advancing our understanding of issues of race in the business law curriculum. And current events and national conversations, especially over the past year, on race and the path towards greater racial equality have inspired a new sense of urgency and provide an important context for these discussions. Now, scholarship and research, of course, complement the faculty's role as teachers and do much to foster our understanding of issues of race and the law. And many of us are familiar with the broad contours of racial inequity and disparity in areas such as banking and tax, debt and wealth, redlining practices, complex and inequitable tax structures, predatory lending schemes, and other examples. Today's panelists, Abby Atkinson and Andrew Hayashi, will explore the impact of these and other rules and regulations that govern financial institutions. In their research efforts, professors Atkinson and Hayashi offer legal solutions to improve equity in the financial system and in financial institutions. The commitment of our faculty participants to analyzing issues of race and business law through both their teaching and their research is an inspiring example of the impact the legal academy can have on expanding our understanding of the most complex and pressing, pressing questions in our legal system, in our society at large. And I look forward to hearing more from our panelists shortly. I, my thanks to Professors Atkinson and Hayashi for sharing their important scholarship with us today. And I'm delighted that Anil Kovali will introduce the panel and moderate today's event. Anil is a Harry A. Bigelow teaching fellow and lecturer in law here at the University of Chicago Law School. His teaching and research interests include corporate law and corporate governance. Thank you for moderating today, Anil. And again, thank you as well to the University of Virginia Law School for partnering with us here at the University of Chicago on this important series. I hope that this series advances teaching and scholarship on the important issues of race and business law. It also is the first of many events that I hope will develop from our partnership with the University of Virginia. And with that, I'm pleased to hand it over to Anil to introduce our panel. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Dean Miles. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists. Abby Atkinson is the Assistant Professor of Law at Berkeley. Her research focuses on the law of debtors and creditors as it impacts marginalized communities. Before joining Berkeley, she was a Thomas C. Gray Fellow and Lecturer in Law at Stanford Law School and the Reginald F. Lewis Fellow at Harvard Law School. She previously practiced as an associate at Gibson Dunn and served as an associate, uh, excuse me, served as a law clerk to Judge Gould of the Ninth Circuit and Judge Patel of the Northern District of California. She graduated from Harvard Law School and received her undergraduate degree from Berkeley. Andrew Hayashi is a class of 1948's professor of scholarly research in law at the University of Virginia School of Law. Uh, he is the director of the Virginia Center for Tax Law. His research focuses on tax law, tax policy, and behavioral law and economics. Before joining UVA, he was the Elganian Research Fellow in, at the Furman Center for Research, excuse me, for Real Estate and Urban Policy at NYU. He previously practiced at Davis Polk and Wardwell. He received his JD and a PhD from Berkeley 
a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and a bachelor's degree from Georgetown. Welcome to you both. We'll be starting with a presentation from Fre Professor Atkinson, which will run for about 20 minutes. We'll then hear from Professor Hayashi for about 20 minutes. We'll hold a joint Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box to send them in. Professor Atkinson. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. So thank you to Dean Miles, to Professor Casey and Professor Huang for inviting me to participate and to share some of my work. Um, so it's a privilege to be here to get to share a work in progress that is related to race and gender and consumer finance uh, with you. Um, as Anil said, my research thinks about, examines the law of creditors and debtors as it uh, crosses many different discrete areas of law and its implications for marginalized groups. And so specifically, I think about how race and gender are implicated and affected by consumer financial structures. So first, uh, before I dig into the project, I'd like to lay a bit of groundwork for the presentation today, for my presentation today. Um, so I think about how uh, credit and debt affect people who struggle the most and communities who tend to struggle the most historically. Um, and I started this examination um, thinking about structural inequality in the bankruptcy code, which of course is our sole means of global debt discharge for distressed debtors. And so it's from this perspective of thinking about distressed consumer debtors from the disproportionate representation of marginalized groups like single women and African-Americans among bankruptcy filers that I've come to spend more time examining the institutional value that we assign to credit and debt and to explore the broader work that we ask credit and debt to do both positively and normatively specifically as an affirmative form of social provision for marginalized groups, like the chronically impoverished women, African-Americans, both individually and then at their various intersections. So it's my view that credit and debt have been proffered as instrumental to the well-being of marginalized groups without meaningful consideration of the social consequences of indebtedness. And so specifically, even as credit is offered as a means of income smoothing and social mobility, debt is often a channel for the very socioeconomic subordination and equality that uh, policymakers mean to address by facilitating greater access to consumer lending and borrowing. So that brings me to the project I will share with you today. And so this project continues this broader project of evaluating the institutional work that we ask credit and debt to do within the broader system of social provision. And specifically, it focuses on how marginalized debt, which I define as the array of high interest rate, subprime uh, risky debt that tends to concentrate in and among historically marginalized communities, how that marginalized debt functions as a source of wealth accumulation for the retirement security of ordinary workers. So the draft hopes to offer both a descriptive and a normative contribution. Descriptively, it surfaces this phenomenon of public pension fund investment in marginalized debt as a source of retirement security by thinking about how public pension funds are increasingly investing in private equity firms who in turn target for profit extraction, uh, uh, in part, marginalized debt dependent industries like for-profit colleges and small dollar uh, lenders. In this context, credit and debt operate as a means of social provision, but not for borrowers necessarily, uh, but for third parties and specifically retirement insecure public workers like teachers, state government, civil servants and police officers. So this descriptive claim then leads to the paper's normative claim that policymakers should be attentive to and wary of this drift toward market-based debt funded social provision because the value of this kind of investing depends on there being a steady pool of marginalized borrowers who consistently have to pay more in interest rates and fees in order to be able to borrow. 
And that's whether or not the debt is fairly priced. So I don't mean to refer just to what we might call a predatory loan that is extended on an interest rate that's not consistent with the risk, but also tries to pick up the notion that for a variety of uh, historical uh, socioeconomic reasons, we might find and we do find that marginalized communities tend to have higher risks of uh, default. And therefore, a way to think about uh, the marginalized debt that is uh, sort of pervades that community is that it's fairly priced, at least from that risk perspective. So uh, I argue then in the paper that public pension fund investment in marginalized debt commodifies the condition of marginalization that engenders this kind of quotidian regular use of this debt among socioeconomically insecure communities. And it not only capitalizes on the persistence of socioeconomic inequality, but given the identity of the purported beneficiaries in the public pension context, namely retirement insecure uh, state workers, it may in a perverse sense justify continued inequality and marginalization. And so it's my view that public pension funds specifically, insofar as they are ostensibly parts of our public system of social welfare, shouldn't participate in this kind of uh, regressive wealth extraction, even though they may do so in service of a, uh, an arguably noble cause, which is to help workers and retirement insecure uh, individuals be able to retire in relative comfort. So first, let me uh, describe a bit about, uh, tell you a bit more about public pension fund investment in marginalized debt. Um, so public pension funds, of course, are huge institutional investors in the market. And so, for example, here in California, where I am, um, the Calp, uh, CalPERS, California Public Employee Retirement System, serves some 2 million of California's public employees and has a market value of approximately $400 billion. An investment is key to CalPERS operation, much like other big public pension funds, because employer and employee contributions only satisfy about 42% of pension obligations as promised by the various California public employees, or excuse me, public employers who participate in CalPERS. And like many other large public pensions, then CalPERS relies significantly on investment to meet its obligations. And as a consequence, then there are a range of private financial intermediaries who are responsible, at least indirectly, for managing this labor's capital to provide for public retirement security. This includes private equity firms, which solicit capital for discrete investment fund, then use the capital investment to purchase an equity stake in some target company for the purpose of extracting value and returns for the fund's capital investors and the private equity firm itself as both an investor and the fund's uh, general manager, general partner. Private equity investment is relatively risky as compared to uh, traditional stable and secure investments like US treasury bonds or other government bonds. Um, but high risk usually means the hope of higher returns and public pension funds need returns and have thus developed an increasing appetite and tolerance for risk. So for example, one study reports that three quarters of public pension fund assets are held in risky alternative investments, including private equities, hedge funds, real estate investment trusts and the like. And this appetite for risk reflects the ethos of diversified investment that forms modern sensibilities in which a competent pension fund manager should diversify as a matter of risk the fund's investments to include both traditionally safe investment and some relatively high risk investment like equity investment. And so unsurprisingly then, public pension funds are the largest institutional investors in private equity, including in those that have taken an equity stake in for-profit colleges, in subprime auto loans, in small dollar installment loans, and other forms of marginalized debt. So with that description then, I just would like to spend a few minutes contextualizing this significance of marginalized debt in our public pension system. Um, it's my view that we should understand this phenomenon of public pension fund investment in marginalized debt against the broader incidence of credit debt as a critical aspect of the American public private welfare regime. 
social provision policy has become so dependent on debt as a tool of social provision for the poor and for the marginalized that the legal debates and policy debates we tend to see are related to how best to improve the access, right? Instead of engaging meaningfully with what is uh, the more fundamental question in my view of whether borrowing should be serving this institutional welfare enhancing function when indebtedness itself is historically and currently a means of both economic and social subordination. What is striking about the institutional work of credit debt in the context of public pension fund investment uh, for the benefit of uh, workers and retirement security is just that, the identity of the purported beneficiary. So when we talk about access to credit for socioeconomically marginalized communities, the borrowers are usually cast as the beneficiaries, right? And these borrowers are encouraged to borrow to smooth income or in uh, increase their chances of social mobility. And at its most optimistic, this approach views marginalized debt as a temporary stepping stone to a better livelihood. It doesn't envision that these communities should continue to borrow under such arguably unfavorable terms into the foreseeable future. In the context of marginalized debt and retirement security, however, where that marginalized debt is conceived as a significant source of wealth extraction for retirement insecure workers, the welfare interest is served when more people rely consistently and regularly on marginalized debt. So it's in this sense that I argue that pension fund investment in marginalized debt commodifies the conditions that predictably and consistently churn out individuals and communities who have very limited options and have to borrow from a Santander Consumer USA to buy a car to drive to work, for example, or who take out a federal aid loan, an educational loan to attend Heald College or Corinthian College or other uh, types of for-profit schools on the belief that when they do so, there's gonna be some steady career, steady income waiting for them on the other side. And instead, at least as to for-profit schools, statistics show that what these marginalized borrowers can truly expect is indebtedness without any meaningful material advancement. Nevertheless, the identity of the ostensible beneficiaries here, retirement insecure workers, and the public purpose that underlies this form of regressive investment arguably shifts the balance here in ways that make the wholesale denouncement of marginalized debt more difficult to countenance. It complicates the story that high interest rate debt that is concentrated in marginalized communities is bad um, when retirement security is otherwise a pillar of the project of American welfare. Moreover, if we consider who tends to occupy the ranks, both historically and now of public pensioners, then there is even greater complexity. Teachers, police officers, DMV workers, and other public servants alike all rely significantly on the pension promises they receive to be able to retire in relative dignity. But there's also a racial and gender equality valence to this side of the balance as well. This type of work, civil service, public school teaching, police work, these are traditionally the sorts of jobs that, for example, black baby boomers and women uh, had access to in terms of social mobility. So consequently, a robust, well-funded public pension fund that can meet these retirement obligations has implications for overall concerns around wealth and wealth inequality, and consequently, takes on even greater social and public significance. So from a consequentialist perspective, this significance perhaps softens the rough edges of regressive wealth redistribution in this particular context. And perhaps even as a normative matter, it might in the balance of things even justify the practice. Even though this arrangement appears to pit one vulnerable group against another, and maybe even within a single person, it might pit one identity instead of interests against another identity instead of interests. Perhaps it is the kind of tragic trade-off to borrow language from Barbara Freed, 
between two normatively sacred values that must nevertheless be subject to aggregative considerations. So this brings me to the, the final bit of my talk then. Um, if you accept that this is a problem, what do we do about it? Um, and so there are implications, both relatively big um, and relatively small, um, that flow from this issue of public pension fund investment in marginalized debt. I'll start with the relatively small. So there are practical ways to think about addressing the problem of regulating uh, public, pension, uh, public pension funds investment in marginalized debt, um, like focusing on fiduciary duty or regulating private equity firms and other private actors tasked with at least indirectly working for the public good. And in this regard, we should also take account of who actually benefits from this arrangement, namely the intermediaries who both set up and then privately regulate these channels of redistribution. In this sense, the workers versus borrowers divide uh, appears more of a facade for what is squarely, again in Barbara Freed's words, a taboo trade-off, namely one between the sacred value of public welfare and equality and the arguably non-sacred value of increasing the wealth of the so-called 1%. So for example, private equity firms are significant winners in this arrangement insofar as they take their cut in fees on the front end and reap a disproportionate profit relative to their investment um, and risk on the back end. Similarly, we might conceive of as winners in this arrangement, public pension fund managers as political actors or state actors with personal political interests that bear little meaningful relationship to whether, for example, a city of Oakland worker where I currently am now can rely on her promised pension. So regulating these industries and these interests um, would be an important intervention and um, relatively small uh, compared to the, the big intervention that I'll mention in just a moment. Um, to push against the forces and other forces that might influence uh, public-minded, welfare-motivated dis uh, investment decision-making. We might also impose greater transparency and standards on private equity firms who are currently relatively free from this kind of regulation. And with respect to public pension fund managers, this might mean redefining, again, their fiduciary duty to account for the broader social consequences of their investment decisions. And this view builds on work by David Weber and Paul Rose, who argue that the current views of pension fund fiduciary duty and public pension fund fiduciary duty specifically are unduly restricted insofar as they mandate uh, a quote, fund first approach. So I think these changes would be good. Right? Um, but I also believe that they would be merely harm reductive, skirting the sort of bigger issues that the instrumental aspects of credit and debt reveal about an increasingly privatized debt reliant American welfare approach that within its market forward frame rationalizes and maybe even justifies the pitting of one vulnerable group against another in the name of wealth extraction. And these larger issues are indeed large issues, right? They live in the very nature and pathology of American capitalism, including racial capitalism and gender capitalism that seem to thrive on marginalization and subordination. And if that's right, then I wonder how we can ask those same market forces to be responsible for important work like remediating historical and entrenched inequality and other aims that ostensibly, purportedly underpin socioeconomic well being. So, uh, in closing, uh, although this paper is sort of narrowly focused on the problem of extractive investment and regressive redistribution in public pensions and marginalized debt, it points to these larger conflicts of interest in market-based social provision, um, including the operation of credit debt market relationships in this social provision context. Um, so thanks so much. I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing Andrew and then to the Q&A. Thank you, Professor Atkinson. Uh, Professor Hayashi? So um, uh, thank you, Abby. Um, I'm grateful to 
be able to sort of share this panel with you. I admire um, not only this project, but your research agenda more broadly. Um, I think it's you're taking on some very big questions and reframing how we think about credit in an interesting um, way. My um, uh, uh, one question I had, um, and I you, you talk about, I, I mean, I think it, it shows up in the paper a bit and in your talk about how you, but I, I wanted to hear a little bit more from you is the extent to which your sort of intuitions about the, the ethics um, of this, this sort of um, relationship are, are based on um, the, the sense that these credit products are exploitative. And so you say it's, it's about marginalized debt. It's not just about predatory debt, but um, what would your reaction be? You could imagine framing this a little bit differently and saying that uh, these pension fund investors are driving down, making it easier for people to access credit when they need it. Uh, and for that reason, they're sort of, you know, th these are credit products that if everybody is sort of entering into rationally, these loans, and they're for, they actually are benefiting the people who are taking them out. We might wish the price was less than it was, but, but the, in the absence of this market, they'd be, they'd be worse off. Um, why isn't the story that actually the pensioners are sort of in solidarity with and are helping the people who, who are taking out these loans by making capital available that, that wouldn't otherwise um, be there? And I, I'm not saying that I necessarily believe that, but I, I'm wondering how much your, your, your intuitions about the rightness of this are based on, some, on, a, on a view that these markets are, these credit products are, are actually bad for the people who are, who are taking them out. Um, thank you. I, you know, I think these credit products are exploitative, um, even when, as you describe, like the best case scenario, we can think it's it's making you know capital available to individuals who need it. In you know, we might think about you know what's going on. I have family down in uh, Galveston, Texas, right? And there are a lot of people who are struggling and might benefit in the short term from being able to get an online small dollar loan. Um, I think this raises important questions that I think are relevant to this panel, right? What, what work does race and marginalization have to do with thinking about finance or finance markets or consumer finance markets, right? Um, in the short term, I think that person should be able to get that loan, right? If they need the money and someone is willing to lend it to them, even if they have to pay more, then it's a good thing in the short term. But I think it's, it's uh, uh, my intuition is that it's a bad thing in the long term because it entrenches the sort of underlying problem of individuals who consistently, when tragedy strikes, you know, um, can't fly to Cancun, you know, <laughs> like that, that have to stick it out and are stuck with no water. Um, and those are the folks sort of, you know, as an empirical matter, those are the folks that use these products. Um, so Dare Morse, uh, 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 my colleague over at the business school here has uh, uh, you know, a paper, as I'm sure you're well aware of it, that thinks about how payday loans are important for people in emergencies. But there's a way to think about um, marginalized groups as living in a perpetual state of emergency, right? That, um, keeping the lights on month to month and sort of needing credit products for um, uh, to smooth income or else uh, you know they they have to get their car fixed because they can't afford to live in the city where they work and so you know they have to take out a loan when the car breaks down so that's sort of the 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 baseline of my concern here I'm less concerned with thinking about well, isn't it good that people can get money when they need it? Of course, yes. If you know, in in the moment, right when the pipes have burst and you need money to get your pipes fixed, get the money to get your pipes fixed. But I worry about sort of how that entrenches the condition of having to go to a, a lending institution in order to um, survive, really, right? As uh, my uh, as Kristen Andersma calls it, survival debt. Um, and then that's problematic that, that, in my view, right, that a pension fund or any other institutional investment is sort of capitalizing on that state of chronic emergency, right? And I want to put my finger on how do we, uh, how do, how does our financial system and particularly consumer finance sort of perpetuate that underlying state of, you know, quotidian emergency, quotidian crisis. 
So, Anil, can I ask a follow up or is, is, do you have a, another question to turn to? Sure. So um, I, I think originally what we plan on doing is having you present your project and then we do a group uh, Q&A or we can, if you prefer to just keep uh, asking. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that's fine with me. So, uh, Professor Hayashi. Okay. All right. So I'll share my screen here. Let's see. All right. Um, are those slides coming across, Anil? Great. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Chicago and uh, and uh, UVA for getting together to put this important series together. Uh, I'd like to thank Dean Miles uh, for the introduction, for hosting this, Tony and Kathy for convening the panel, particularly to Anil for moderating. I'm grateful to share this work with you. And again, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be um, sort of sharing the virtual panel with Abby, whose work I greatly admire and who's asking some really uh, uh, big questions. Uh, my question's the question that motivated this project, I think, sounds sounds a little smaller, but I think it actually ends up introducing some big, big questions, at least uh, for me. So let me let me just say a little bit about the motivation um, for this project, um, and uh, and it begins with with property assessment. Uh, and there's a long history of discriminatory, particularly racially discriminatory, property assessment. So there's a legal historian, there's a historian here named Andrew Carl at UVA who, who's written a lot about that. And, and the, the potential for that comes in because the appraisal process is um, very subjective. Uh, and so particularly um, before the adoption of sort of more sophisticated uh, statistical uh, models for estimating property values, there was a, a, there's an enormous scope for discretion by the assessor to uh, overvalue, um, uh, overassess uh, uh, Black-owned properties, which historically has, has been the case. Um, uh, things are better now uh, in, in, in almost every jurisdiction, I would hazard, hazard to say. Um, the process for property appraisal is more standardized, professionalized. Um, the use of statistical models for estimating home prices is in principle more transparent. You could get under the look under the hood to see what things are, uh, are worth. Nevertheless, um, notwithstanding that, there was the Washington Post ran a, an article this summer um, to, reporting some results from a great paper by uh, Troop Howard uh, at Berkeley, Carlos Avenancio Leon in Indiana, um, doing it was just done a tremendous job at identifying sort of in, in na nationally that black owned homes tend to be over assessed relative to comparable white owned homes, uh, which is to say they're valued more highly for property tax purposes. Um, um, uh, and so because properties are taxed based on their uh, appraised value, then that, that results in a higher tax burden on those homes. And, and their explanation for that is that in adjusting home, in setting, in, in estimating home prices, uh, assessors use home price indices that are too coarse. So you could imagine an extreme example, for example, looking at well, how have home values in Chicago changed, in New York City changed over the last year, uh, and using that to adjust all appraised values, when in fact there's a lot of variation within within that uh, within that area in in the rate of home growth, and in fact. Uh, uh, they think what's going on is that um, in predominantly minority neighborhoods, uh, uh, home prices are not increasing as fast as they are in, in predominantly white neighborhoods. And so you get an overstatement of the, the increase in the property value. So the core claim is that the reason for this overvaluation uh, of minorities, specifically black owned homes, is sort of this imprecision um, in the appraisal process. And I think that's a plausible account, but it, it made me think that uh, about a paper I wrote back in 2014, actually about property tax caps in New York City uh, and, and thinking whether they're also maybe playing a role in the overassessment of minority, uh, especially black owned homes. So just by way of quick background, for property tax purposes, the market value of homes uh, of properties is redetermined periodically. Um, every couple years uh, in some places, New York City does it every year. It depends on the assessor's capacity and it can also be sort of an institutional design choice. But the market value, the fair market value is just an input into the assessed value, um, uh, which is what you're actually taxed on. Um, the, um, sometimes the assessed value is a fixed fraction of fair market value. Uh, 
So the fair market value of the home may be $400,000, but your assessed value is $200,000. It's 50% of the market value. Um, and then sometimes it's more complicated and many jurisdictions impose caps or limits on the annual rate of increase in assessed values. So uh, for example, New York City, uh, again, revalues all homes each year, reappraises them, but no matter how quickly properties appreciate in value, the assessed value can't increase by more than 6% in one year or more than 20% over five years. Uh, so what that means, um, the assessment ratio, the ratio of the assessed value to the market value is that that assessment ratio declines in rapidly appreciating markets because that market value is going up fast, but the assessed value is not keeping up, right? So that fraction is going down over time. So uh, to just to, not to belabor the point, but to, if you consider two homes in New York City, home one, say in Queens, is worth $860,000 in 2020. Uh, it's assessed for eight, its assessed value is that same amount. Uh, suppose the value stays the same over the next year. And so it's also worth 860,000 and its assessed value is 860,000 the next year. And then contrast that with home two, which is located in say Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, and from 20 to 21, its market value increases from 800 to 860,000. But the assessed value is capped in terms of the rate of increase. And so its assessed value is only 848,000 uh, in 2021. So what we, we get is two homes with the same market value, but the assessed value and therefore the tax associated with home two is less than the tax associated with home one. Okay, so why do I think this relates to, could potentially explain this empirical regularity where black owned homes are over assessed? Well, it would need to be the case that um, uh, white neighborhoods, predominantly white neighborhoods, grow more quickly, they appreciate more quickly than black neighborhoods. And that is generally what we find uh, in, the, in, the, in the literature, in the social science literature. Um, so the, the empirical evidence is that home values in predominantly white neighborhoods, but especially neighborhoods that are becoming whiter, uh, tend to appreciate more quickly. And, you know, this research, it's not like there's a sort of bulletproof study, I would say in my judgment, that would answer any questions you might have. But there are a lot of efforts to control for other things that might be changing, things like income uh, of the residents, education, crime levels, and so on. Um, so race, uh, the changing demographic composition of the neighborhood does have an effect, does appear, I, I would, I think the best conclusion is that changing racial demographics of the neighborhood do affect, um, the, the rate of home price growth. And that effect is, is not constant. Uh, uh, it looks like that as racial minorities increase from zero to 20% of the population, that that has, that slows, there's a, a slowdown in home price growth, not much of an effect between 20 and 80%. And then again, an increase, uh, a, a real effect on home price growth as minorities grow from 80 to 100% of the population. Um, and you could speculate on sort of what sort of white homeowner preferences might be that might reflect sort of sensitivity at those two, two sort of ends of the spectrum. Uh, so, so this is a table from that 2014 paper. Uh, what I did is I broke up the neighborhoods in New York City by how much they save in taxes because they, those caps hold their assessed value below the fair market value. Um, the bottom row in, includes uh, neighborhoods you can see uh, where the average amount of tax saved because of these caps is more than $28,000. So the assessment caps are saving people in those neighborhoods $28,000 annually in property taxes relative to what they would otherwise owe. Um, that's, that's a lot of money. These are, you know, home prices in New York are high, um, but that's still, that's still a lot of money. The next columns uh, report the racial makeup of those neighborhoods. And you can see, look, sort of looking top to bottom, it's not always the case that neighborhoods that are appreciating quicker and are saving more in taxes are whiter, but certainly for that top, that, that, that bottom line uh, where the savings are the greatest, that has a, a highest share of white residents and the lowest share of, uh, of black residents um, and sort of an, and a relatively low share of, of Asian residents as well. Um, the last two columns report the share of homeowners in that those neighborhoods that had a uh, had a mortgage and also the average tenure, the length of time the homeowners had lived there. Uh, and you, in, in that sort of top end, it's uh, people who've lived there less long on average uh, than in other neighborhoods. A lot of this was going on in sort of gentrifying parts of Brooklyn. Uh, 
Maryland, which is the, the state that I study in, in, in this paper, uh, doesn't have caps. What they do is they phase in increases in property value over a period of years. And that has a similar effect of depressing, de depressing assessed values sort of in a boom market. Uh, and so this table compares the share of all homeowners in each racial group with the share of the tax benefits that they derive from uh, sort of this phase in of property values in rapidly appreciating areas. And I did, I looked at both 2008, 2017. 2008, you can see, for example, that although um, uh, whites make up a little under 63% of the homeowner population, uh, they receive about 70% of the tax benefits from these phase ins, reflecting the fact that they were living in homes that had rapidly appreciated. Uh, in 2017, those effects had moderated considerably, and it's, it's about the same uh, uh, across, across racial groups. All right. so, so why do property values in predominantly white neighborhoods grow faster, or conversely, why do property values in predominantly minority neighborhoods grow more slowly? Um, in the paper, I talk about a sort of two, this is a familiar distinction in the literature, the, the idea that two people might have sort of use race. The marginal entrant to the, to the neighborhood is deciding whether to, to move in. Um, and they might have either direct sort of preferences for who their neighbors are, for the racial composition of the neighborhood, uh, or they might be using race, the racial demographics of the neighborhood as a proxy. So um, people might want to live around people who are predominantly of their same ethnic or racial uh, group. Um, they have some affinity for them, or they might have animus for other groups and not want to live around, around them. Um, uh, there's sort of a direct preference for who, who, you, who you live next door to. The other use of race is as a proxy, uh, and there's a pretty substantial literature on, on, on this. Um, so for example, perceptions of school quality. Um, uh, it appears that white parents tend to perceive schools with a higher proportion of black students as being more dangerous and of lower quality. Uh, perceptions of neighborhood safety. Um, people tend to perceive there to be a higher crime risk in areas with more, uh, more black residents, particularly young black male residents. Even after controlling for official crime rates and neighborhood statistics, there's a, an inference that people draw um, about neighborhood safety based on the, the demographics. You know, finally, why else might people think race is in the neighborhood is correlated with sort of um, uh, um, the value from of living there? Um, it, it could be that there's a relationship between homeowner demographics and the relationship to local government, uh, their ability to get favorable treatment. Uh, from government on issues related to, say, zoning or traffic, also relationship to public safety uh, officers. Uh, how is the neighborhood policed? Um, one might, uh, home buyers might think that certain neighborhoods are going to be more aggressively policed. It's going to be a less place, pleasant place to live for that reason, or their calls won't be answered. Uh, one way, one way or another. So, um, okay. So if if neighborhood racial composition were fixed, then that would explain differences in property values across neighborhoods, but it wouldn't explain differences in assessment ratios, such as those that Howard and Evanazio Leon find. For that, you need change. So to see, describe how this would play out, you can consider just a, a really stylized example um, to illustrate the point. Um, you have one neighborhood here, um, uh, which is more, and the homes here are more valuable than those in neighbor, neighborhood two. Um, and suppose that it's solely due to the, the demographics of the neighborhood. The value of homes in neighborhood one is 50 million, the value of homes in neighborhood two is 30 million, and that's solely a function of the fact of the, of the neighborhood demographics, which may be related again to perceptions of school quality or crime or, or whatever else uh, it is. Um, they're both home, the, the, assess, the assessed value of homes in neighborhood one is equal to the market value, same in neighborhood two. The assessment ratio in both cases is one. Neighborhood one is paying more in taxes because their properties are more valuable, okay? And this is assuming a tax rate of 1% uh, at the bottom of the screen here. A very stylized exam example. Suppose now just that the blue residents move into the red neighbor uh, residents' neighborhood and displace them. And so all that happens is they switch neighborhoods. They swap homes. Um, 
uh, the, the, the blue residents moving in and displacing the red residents. So what's the consequence of that? Well, the folks who've moved to neighborhood one, their properties are still worth $30 million, again, again because I've assumed it just depends on who's living there. And the assessed values are also $30 million. Their assessment ratio is still one, and they're paying the same amount of tax in aggregate as they were before. The, the, the blue residents, the new residents of neighborhood two, their homes are worth $50 million. In some sense, they brought the value with them, but the assessment, the assessed values of the homes are capped. They were 30 million before the move. If we assume, for example, that the uh, cap is 10%, as I've done here, then the assessed value of their homes is 33 million, meaning their assessment ratio, which is 33 over 50, is 66%. And so at a 1% tax rate, their tax is only $330,000. Previously, as solely as a result of them switching neighborhoods, the blue residents have cut their taxes by $170,000. For the local government, there's an effect on their revenues because the total assessed value of properties has fallen. And so their revenues have fallen to 630,000. So, so far, this is a story about racial gentrification leading to lower assessment ratios for the gentrifiers and those who are displaced. And it comes at the government's expense. That may not be the end of the story. So many jurisdictions set the property tax rate to collect a certain amount of revenue. So they wait to see what the assessed values of properties are, and then they set the rate. In that case, to raise the same amount of revenue as before, the local government needs to increase its tax rate from 1 to 1.27% in this case. And the net result is that the lower property taxes enjoyed by the blue residents are a direct transfer from the red residents. So not only are the blue residents better than they were before, now it's coming entirely at the expense uh, of the, the, the people who are dislocated. All right. Um, I'm just, I'll just kind of summarize briefly that, you know, Things are, are more complicated than this, obviously, and whether this empirical regularity that uh, white homes are, or black homes are sort of overassessed relative to white homes, it's a prediction of this model, but it depends you know, on how quickly gentrification happens, uh, how quickly prices adjust. Um, and so, uh, so I think this could explain part of what we, the national story, but, um, uh, but, um, but it's probably not the whole thing. And I also wanted to note that sort of the actual tax incidence of these cap benefits depends. So when the blue residents move into the red residents neighborhood and buy homes from them, there's a tax benefit that might be capitalized into the sales price of the home. And so the actual economic benefit might end up being split between the gentrifiers and the gentrified. All right, let me just wrap up by, by talking about sort of this, this normative, the normative turn to sort of left to be, I think, followed up on. Um, um, and that's that, you know, the project began with this empirical question, finding, ex, trying to explain why black homeowners are overassessed. Um, and, but by focusing on how property taxes, tax caps operate when the underlying market reflects these sort of racialized preferences, uh, it sort of turned my attention to a different normative question. And that's how the tax system treats racial preferences embedded in market prices. Um, my concern is not so much with the market discrimination. That's a, that's a, I'll leave that for other people. That's a big uh, topic, but, but how, but the tax system piggybacks on market prices in assigning tax burdens. And so when, for example, racial preferences show up in the market as say higher wages for white workers than, 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 um, uh, people of color or for men or for women for that matter, that wage premium is taxed. So at least the tax system isn't sort of treating that wage premium any better than other kinds of income. Um, and the same is true of the property tax in general, right? Any benefits in terms of property value that come from sort of proximity to, uh, to white households is taxed. But in a neighborhood that's becoming whiter, uh, that, that's gentrifying in this way, that those neighborhoods are favored uh, in, a, in, a, in a jurisdiction that has these kinds of caps. So it's not really just a story about disparate impact. And I put that in quotes because sometimes I think disparate impact is really all that matters. But um, it's about the tax base and whether it actually encourages processes that reflect racial, um, uh, these, kinds of, these kinds of racial preferences. Because again, just by it's brought up very starkly in that sort of 
animation, just by switching homes and sort of this process of displacement leads to a reduction in, uh, in overall taxes that may end up being redistributed by the local government. But, um, but in this way, these caps can actually subsidize the process of gentrification. So I think that's a, that's, um, a, 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 um, a different and um, a very troubling sort of uh, problem I was sort of left with at the end, at the end of the paper. So yeah, that's it. thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have a joint Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please use the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen uh, to enter them and I'll, I'll start sharing them. Thought I'd kick things off though by uh, following up on one of Pro uh, Professor Hayashi's observations, uh, which is just to ask, you know, are there clear villains in either of the stories that you're telling? So for Professor Atkinson, uh, it really seems like what we have are market participants doing what market participants do, which is act at the margins. And they're actually often acting in ways that are reasonable and even morally justifiable, you know, offering credit that's wanted uh, at a theoretically, uh, actually rarely fair rate. Uh, and then you have pension fund uh, managers who are simply trying to maximize their returns on behalf of uh, retirees within this overall system where they're not getting out of the contributions and in a marketplace that just operates the way it does. Uh, and then similarly for Professor Hayashi, you know, it seems like racialized preferences do play an important role in the dynamic uh, that you're discussing, but it's not as if we can point at an individual person and say, hey, you have a problematic attitude, you're driving this phenomenon. It's, it's not, for example, uh, the gentrifiers themselves who have these problematic attitudes. It's really the marketplace as a whole. Uh, so first of all, is that right? Uh, are there any villains who we can sort of point to? Uh, and if not, is that sort of a common feature of this particular area of scholarship, you know, race and the intersection with business and finance? Abby, do you want to go first or? Um, you know, well, I, so, <laughs> um, sure. So I want to push back against the idea of a villain, right? That, you know, I think by finding a villain, it's easier to just sort of say if we can pluck that person or regulate that in interest, then we're good. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of these sort of exploitative processes are baked in, right, baked into our system such that we don't need to identify villains, the system itself sort of produces this um, outcome. And so what strikes me listening to, um, you know, Andrew's findings, you know, I, I see a same story of regressive redistribution. And I, you know, so again, I live in the Bay Area and I live in Oakland, which is a city that has just, the gentrification is off the charts um, in a really short period of time. And from a broader perspective, there's a view that that's really good. You know, it's good for, for everyone in Oakland when, you know, Uber's thinking about coming here or tech workers are leaving San Francisco and coming to Oakland, right? This sort of wave of gentrification is kind of has a broader public benefits. And so it strikes me that, you know, we would want to subsidize. I'm not surprised that we would have a tax system that subsidizes the, the early movers in the process of gentrification, right? That gives a tax benefit to the ones who are willing to sort of go into the neighborhood before it, it becomes like hipster cool to, to live there, right? And that, that helps to shift the, the, shift the neighborhood. So, um, and just as in that story, and I think in the story that I'm trying to tell, I don't think that there are clear villains. I don't think there is invidious purposes here. I think instead, and I think that's sort of the challenge in thinking about broader structures of the law generally, or thinking about how our structural finance or a system um, sort of perpetuates problems that we care about is to sort of identify the systemic aspects of it rather than looking to find a particular um, bad apple to call from the bucket. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think the, you know, so, so one, one thing I think I would say is that sort of, uh, you know, people's preferences, preferences and both their sort of stereotypical judgments are showing up in demand for these homes. Um, so whether the people who hold those are villains or not, is not my 
I, I can't do anything about it. And it's not my sort of <laughs> expertise, you know, I, I, I have my own views, but that's, that's, that's just mine. Um, but what I do think is that um, in the case of the effect, the redistributive effects of the caps, uh, I also don't think there's any uh, in bad intent. You know, a lot of these were adopted, in fact, to try and sometimes to try and protect people who are currently living there, right? The concern, there's sort of a well, it's always sort of trotted out the so sort of example of a person on a fixed income, an elderly person who's lived in the neighborhood and can't afford to pay their property taxes as the Whole Foods moves in and, and, and the neighborhood changes. Um, and uh, so that people have made that argument in defense of these caps. And you, so you might think it actually came from a good place in terms of trying to protect people who are vulnerable to, to, to dislocation. I, I think there are better ways of achieving those goals. And I think what's kind of was, int is, was interesting to me is this actually kind of can cut, it's not just protecting people who are in, gentr who are in gentrified neighborhoods, it might actually be, be encouraging um, it. Uh, and I think to Abby's point about the fact that sometimes these, you know, the, the, the challenge with these laws or institutions that have these effects is not that the, the, they, they emanated from animus to begin with, but that the political process that causes people to get, that allows these things to get fixed is not available to everybody in quite the same way. So another finding, just uh, last thing I'll say is another finding that uh, Howard and Evidencio Leon have is that um, black homeowners appeal their property assessments less frequently than white homeowners. Mm -hmm. So that by putting this sort of self-help for bad administration on the homeowner, it, it, it sort of, it ha there, there's, there's less sort of, um, uh, it can exacerbate um, some of these, some of these um, inequalities. So, yeah. Right. Um, one thread that you just uh, mentioned is that uh, it might be possible to protect the interests of sort of a long-standing member of the community who would otherwise be pressured by property taxes. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. And there's an audience question uh, just asking whether we should simply remove caps across the board and simply mark to market. It would seem to create that kind of problem. So if you have a solution, it would be great to know. Yeah. So I, um, I think the caps are bad for a lot of reasons, and it kind of depends on how they're implemented. So my answer would be to the person that my my feeling is that they should be done away with across the board. They they create different problems in different places. So in California, the new home new buy, uh, somebody who buys a home doesn't inherit that old favorable assessment, but for that reason, nobody moves. So it's created a real problem of sort of lock in, uh, which also probably happens to entrench segregation over time because it, it just means old patterns of homeownership and preferences sort of persist longer than might make sense. So, so what would you do about the people whose property value, home taxes are going up a lot? That's primarily a liquidity problem, right? I mean, their, their taxes are going up because their properties are going up. Um, and so there the issue is for somebody who's on a fixed income per, you know, in particular, how do you allow them to access equity in their home or otherwise sort of fund that tax in, in the meantime? Um, and there are a number of states that have um, provide for deferral, limited deferral for senior citizens, um, disabled persons um, uh, that allows them to pay off an, an accumulating property tax liability with, uh, with interest uh, when there's a liquidity event. I think when you sell the home uh, or maybe when you when you die. So, so you know there are administrative costs that come with that, and the city municipality or the, has to finance that in the meantime. But I, I think that's a much better solution than than the caps. That's where you're going to say uh, solve it with debt. You know, just act yes, <laughs> right. There's a new market there. <laughs> oh, the answer. Right. Uh, another audience question uh, for Professor Atkinson. Uh, why not extend the fiduciary duty obligation more broadly than public pension funds? Uh, is this just the first step in getting at those products? Yeah, I mean, that that seems like a, a, a natural extension. You know, again, the, the paper sort of artificially um, thinks about public pension funds insofar as perhaps there's the greatest sort of um, support for that kind of uh you know, regulation that insofar as public pension funds are really supposed to be serving the public good, then, you know, perhaps there's a greater case for states to regulate, um, you know, the fiduciary duty or the obligations of public pension fund managers. 
but with respect to the underlying problem of just sort of, um, you know, investment that's regressive in nature and that's extracting wealth from, uh, from marginalized communities, sure. I mean, that extends beyond pension funds. It extends to university endowments. It extends to any investors who are, you know, institutional investors who are seeking to kind of increase their, their, uh, their wealth. So, I mean, it's a stark sort of case just because of the role that they play in society and the sort of rhetorical force that they have in our politics, but it's not a sort of fundamental difference between. Yeah, that, you know, public pension funds and pension funds generally are supposed to, you know, they're the sort of quintessential form of social provision, right? They're supposed to be working, you know, broadly for the benefit of of the community. And so to the extent that they, you know, that purpose is intention then with the source of wealth extraction in this particular example. Whereas, you know, um, we might think someone who, or an entity that just has a profit motive and is not interested in sort of serving a broader public purpose, then, you know, it's at least more understandable that the source of the wealth would be, you know, not a concern, but public pensions are supposed to be you know, uh, broadly speaking, right? They're, they should be anyway concerned with sort of the work that they're doing to support the welfare of their communities. Um, do you see the incremental steps that you've offered as being steps towards a systematic solution or is it sort of going in a different direction? And I, I do sort of wonder, for example, whether the incremental steps might, you know, cause a lot of harm in the short term absent some broader political solution in which sort of transition away from using debt as social provision uh, and contribute more to pension funds. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, I certainly think it's an empirical question about whether in the short term, you know, um, regulating public pension funds, fiduciary duty to, to uh, limit investment or regulating private equity differently would be useful. I mean, I, I, you know, it's subject to empirical assessment to figure out whether these sort of shorter term, uh, relatively smaller interventions would actually um, improve the welfare of the communities that are implicated by this. Um, but, you know, so again, I think that they are, you know, to the extent that there was the political will to do that, that I would characterize it nevertheless as harm reductive, right? And we know we have, uh, we live in a market society in which investment is at the core across a range of uh, dimensions. And so perhaps the thing to do then is to try to reduce the harm that that investment does. Um, and it might be the case that, for example, you know, by precluding uh, public pension funds from investing in, in this kind of debt, that they instead decide to invest in, you know, venture capital or the next app, you know, and we think, well, who do we want to get this capital, the app, you know, the app developer or the person in Galveston, Texas, who needs, you know, emergency pipe fixing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might, you know, I can see that as being sort of a, a you know, a negative externality of this kind of regulation, right? We might actually impose harm on the communities by cutting off the source of capital that they need in times of emergency. Um, so it's harm reductive, right? Um, and it doesn't, you know, admittedly, it doesn't sort of press on the deeper question, you know, that sort of puzzles me. Um, you know, how to think about disentangling the sort of structural aspects of inequality of marginalization, particularly in our system of consumer finance in ways that um, tend to improve overall e uh, equality. Uh, one more question from the audience that I think is a little bit related, uh, which is would requiring CalPERS to disclose the subjects of their private equity investment be sufficient to resolve the problems that you've identified? Uh, for example, would it cause CalPERS to sort of regulate their private equity investment holdings, uh, or would it cause CalPERS to do something different, like uh, pick different private equity investments or get out of private equity entirely? Yeah, I mean, I you know, the state of California has a lot of power to regulate what CalPERS does. Um, and sure, I mean, the state could adopt the position of greater transparency, um, uh, that CalPERS, you know, has to disclose, you know, whenever, for example, highlight whenever the investment is in some form of marginalized debt. It might be helpful. Um, I think that, you know, as I've uh, uh, 
researched in this area, there are a range of kind of choose your social issue investments, right? So that, you know, you might not care about deforestation in the Amazon, but you care about, you know, uh, um, tobacco, <laughs> you don't like smoking. So you're gonna invest in the tobacco fund um, that embraces deforestation um, in the Amazon. And so, you know, in a way it's kind of like one way to, to think about it would just be add marginalized debt to the list of, you know, gender equality funds and deforestation funds and, you know, child labor funds, international child labor funds um, to sort of satisfy the concern about not regressively investing. But, you know, again, it's harm reductive. It doesn't get at the deeper problem of, you know, if you have a pot of money and you need to increase its value, you have to invest somewhere, right? And we live in an unfair world in which on some level we might see, you know, regressivity that's a little, you know, that that's troublesome. Right. Um, Professor Hayashi, um, was, I was a little bit curious if I was understanding the dynamics that you're playing at correctly. Uh, and one question was simply whether the effect that you're describing really depends on a high degree of residential segregation in which diffusion is only happening in one direction, you know, white people moving into and taking over uh, neighborhoods that are not white. Um, if there was sort of moving in the opposite direction, it seems like the dynamic would almost go in reverse. And perhaps, you know, that's another troubling aspect of the, the dynamic you're pointing at. Um, is, do I have that right? Or I think you might be muted. Yeah, I, could you, I guess, just say a little bit more about what the reverse dynamic is? You sure. Think you, yeah. So if you imagine sort of people moving into the all white neighborhood, uh, and if the market then treats the neighborhood as being less desirable as a result, you would see, you know, the market rates declining fast, but the, the assessed value wouldn't adjust downwards as quickly. And what we would expect to see then is that white people are, you know, have a higher, um, you know, assessed to market value ratio, mm -hmm. uh, and which, you know, troubling on a lot of dimensions. Number one, it doesn't seem to be what you're seeing, which suggests that, you know, that that type of movement isn't really happening. Mm -hmm. And then number two, to the extent it does happen, it would seem to stiffen the already existing sort of opposition to, to diversity. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, um, when you have, you know, if there, there's evidence that the, the racial composition affects the home prices, there's, um, um, there's going to be resistance from property owners for because of the market value effects as well as the the tax effects. Um, I live in Charlottesville and bought a uh, so and I suspect the market value effects are sort of first order mm -hmm. compared to the, the 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 tax effects. I live in Charlottesville, of course, and um, my home is about a hundred years old, and there's still a racial covenant on the uh, on the deed. Um, and you know, there are a variety of reasons that. But 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 it's a well. It's it's something that people people say they worry about the neighborhood, right? And um, so I but I think the effects are the, the the first order effects would be the effect on home values and the taxes. You're right. It would lead to sort of a convergence of the assessment ratio to one. It would it would go up. Yeah. I did have one broad question for I think both of you. Uh, it seems like both of you could have framed your projects in non-racial terms. Like you could have, Professor Hayashi, you could have just spoken it entirely in terms of sort of gentrification. Uh, Professor Atkinson, you could have just spoken about sort of exploitive loan terms for individuals as opposed to communities. Um, but it does seem like adding race to this, the conversation adds something to the scholarship and improves our understanding of what's going on. Um, and I guess the first question is, do I have it right that, you know, the underlying dynamic doesn't necessarily require sort of racial angle. And then number two, you know, if, if that is right, you know, what led you to pursue this particular aspect of it? Uh, and are there any sort of general lessons that you might have for people who are into business and finance, but not necessarily exploring the racial angles of the problems that they're looking at? Um, I don't, you know, my view is I don't think it's possible to have this discussion without thinking about race and gender and marginalization. Um, and I guess that's because I start from a position uh, that, you know, we, I don't think we can think about the market as an autonomous entity. Um, you know, I, I, 
ag agree with the economic sociologists who have thought about the world and the market as being embedded in the, the society in which it exists. So um, can we think abstractly about problems of regressive redistribution sort of writ large? Sure, but I don't know why we would wanna do that, um, quite frankly, because it ignores a harsh reality of our economy and sort of, of the nature, uh, uh, in my view, of American capitalism. Um, that is founded in significant ways and that you know implicates issues of race and of inequality. Um, right. So so which is to say, I don't think you know, race is like, let's just season it with, let's just throw race in there to spice it up. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's like at the core of thinking about. Um, for me, particularly then issues of credit and debt and consumer finance, right? And um, Andrew talks about home ownership and value and home value, right? We can trace that, you know, we have, there's tons of work to trace that concept of home value back to racialized notions of, you know, um, preference right the nice way to say it is like you you know you just have a preference not for living next to someone that doesn't look like you right um so i just i don't i don't think it's proper to do to extract and to think about um financial issues writ large um outside of this social context of you know our unique American culture uh, with its pathology of racism and sexism. Um, and I also, you know, obviously uh, my opinion, I also don't think it's advisable, right? If, if we purport to want to move the ball forward as much of our national conversation uh, tends to be uh, currently, then I think we have to see it, right? And we have to acknowledge it. Um, and not think about the world with without acknowledging it. Um, so that, that was well said. I, I so um, the, the easy answer is that actually the project was motivated by trying to explain this fact that uh, black homeowners are overassessed. Um, but uh, that, that I had seen this summer, and that that I had seen in other parts of my work, and. Um, I think, and as I said at the, at the end of my presentation, like I find I've seen these disparate impacts show up. I mean, I, if I'm working on home, pro, home, you know, home ownership and property, I mean, it's, it's everywhere, right? I've mentioned the covenant. I mean, there's this long history Abby mentioned. So, and, and the, the, the fact that black homeowners are less likely to appeal their assessments is something I'd found in my own work as well. And in that case, some of what's going on is a federal policy about requiring mortgage escrow, which sounds innocuous, but but the people who pay their their bank instead of the uh, the um, um, the local government, and that's disproportionately people of color who are taking out the mortgages where that's required. And when you pay out of escrow, you're less likely to know your assessment, and you're less likely to appeal. So another sort of unintended consequence of this that has these disparate impacts. So I've been just troubled by those for a long time. But then as again, as I started to think more about what was going on in this particular context, it wasn't just a disparate impacts, it's, it's we are encouraging these caps um, treat the, the sort of value, the market prices associated that reflect, uh, um, which I have very antiseptically described as racial preferences, in this, in this favorable way. And as I said, in a lot of cases, these market prices that are that embed discrimination, at least tax law doesn't seem to make it worse, right? But in this case, in this case, I would, I would say it is, and that sort of stuck with me, um, is, is um, you know, uh, this sort of, sort of conceptually, this other thing going on uh, in the context where, again, if you study property taxes, race is, has always sort of mattered. Um, and so um, um, I couldn't just sort of ig ignore it in this, in this setting, so. I think uh, time is almost up. So I'll just, I'll just close by thanking both of you again.
uh, for your participation and for your presentations. These are great projects and learned a lot from them. Uh, thanks again. Thank you.